and it's quite the story folks watching movies right here since nineteen thirty five with the good time growing up to twenty seventeen when the grand old lady was almost torn down but thanks to fundraising it was saved by a group of community volunteers folks like you and now the less fails to show piece a not-for-profit charitable organization restored to its full glory and heritage designated to boot cool so then right from this very seat you could check out way more than just great movies there's all kinds of arts and culture music uh, talks uh, performances and of course popcorn but like in all good stories there's an unexpected twist 2020 hits and bam the new normal with stages going dark all over the world uh, oh thank thank you now it doesn't take a phd in accounting to know no lights no camera no cash which means we need a little help from our friends to keep on keeping on so if you can donate a little or a lot it sure would help us keep the lights on making you one of the heroes of this story. Stay tuned for the next chapter in the West Dell. Evening, folks, and welcome to the West Dale. It's Hamilton Originals Night, and we've got Gary Lucas. Take it away, Gary. How you doing? Excellent. There was no question, none were ever asked What he did yesterday never mattered You can find him anywhere, slightly out of sight Checking out the sound effects the crowd will hear that night Goes about his business, his passion, I suppose. You can find him backstage wearing someone else's clothes. Call him a roadie, a night on the open road. No one knows the story, no one. Watches from the shadows when the band begins to shine. He knows all the local girls and what they needed him for. He was the key to all their dreams behind the backstage door. He even knows where the light goes, where the light goes out. The rock and roll roading, what it's all about. When all is said and done, and all the stories told, he knows he was a major part, and now he's growing old. He could write it all down with nothing left to hide. What a journey, what a high, what an amazing ride.
in three quarter time and watches from the shadows when the band begins to shine when all is said and done and all the stories told knows he was a major part now he's growing old he could ride it all down with nothing left to hide what a journey what a high what an amazing ride what an amazing ride what an amazing ride nice gary that's one of gary's own songs the Thanks, roadie man. thank you very much and welcome to the show good well, to have thank you. you good thank to have you, you here now, I got to say, folks, before we get into the show, we have some sad news, and that is that um, we sent the crew out to Peterborough to, to be there with Ronnie, but um, he's not feeling well, uh, so he was actually in bed, and um, we're going to do the show without him, uh, I'm sad to say. He was going to be talking on the phone with us, um, but uh, that's not going to happen. But we still got a lot of great stories to tell about uh, Ronnie, and... Let me uh, tell you who Gary is. Gary Lucas, I would say, is Ronnie's best friend. Uh, he, I, I, I never would have known, except Gary's uh, been so kind as to take me there several times in the last few months. And uh, I've got to know Ronnie, and I've got to see the relationship uh, that they've got going, and they truly are best friends. But um, unfortunately, Ronnie's just not uh, well. He was uh, in bed and not coming out. So. We're going to carry on without them, but uh, like I say, we got some great stories, and uh, we'll start with Gary here. I mean, that's all we got tonight is Gary, but <laughs> we're going to... In person. In person, <laughs> live in the flesh. So, um, Gary, like, you grew up on the Hamilton Mountain, I believe. Yes, I did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I went to Hill Park High School and G.L. Armstrong uh, Elementary School, and uh, yeah, it was... Uh, and the first time I met Ronnie, I was like 16 years old. And now a friend of mine took me out to Port Dover Summer Gardens Theater. And uh, I'll never forget it. I, I was absolutely stunned when I saw how good these guys were and the kind of an entertainer that Ronnie was. And uh, it, was a, it was a huge shock to me. And I, I think it changed my life. It changed what goals I had in life and what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got a picture, I think, Jordana, of... Um Number one of uh, Gary back in the day, um, not that one. Uh, it would be pick one of, uh, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> Gary back in the day with his, uh, there we go. And uh, yeah, there's Gary uh, the, wearing the hat and the white suit. Yeah, it was a pretty scary looking bunch of characters, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So what year was that? That would have been... 1980. 1980. Okay, so we skipped right from Hill Park to 1980. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, the next shot we have, I believe, is, well, here's a write-up of your new band uh, hitting the Golden Garter in 1979. 79, right? yeah. And uh, I see there on the right is uh, John Lewis. Terrific guitar player, a friend of mine. Um, always, a, always a pleasure and, a, and an honor to play with you know, people like that and people like you guys here. Huh. I mean, my God. I've been blessed with uh, being able to play with some incredible musicians and present county uh, company uh, included, of course. Oh, great. Well, um, and I, I'd like to say that um, we've got a, a CD of yours. Can we zoom in on this? I should have sent you a digital photo, mm -hmm. but this is Gary's latest CD. It's from 2017. It's pretty recent anyway. We can't remember when we did it, when you did it, but anyway, it's uh, called The Roadie, uh, based on uh, the song that you just heard. There's some other fantastic songs in here. I know Ronnie Hawkins thinks this is one of the best CDs ever, so uh, that's good enough for me. Um, now, just uh, one of the other tunes on here I'd like to do with you, Gary, is about the Steel Town Fiddler. Yeah, I, I wrote that song, the first song I ever wrote, and uh, I was sleeping one night, and uh, it just came to me. I remember this old fiddle player who played the streets of Hamilton in the 50s and 60s, and I went downstairs and grabbed my guitar and wrote a few verses out from memory, and uh, 
worked it for a while and worked it and worked it and uh, you know with the help again of a lot of terrific musicians uh, came up with a proper bridge and Bob Deutsch here behind me sure helped me a lot with that and uh, and uh, I was very lucky to be able to record it at Grant Avenue Studio with Bob and uh, I, I can't tell you how um, how thrilled I was to be able to do that at this incredible studio yeah. um, and that's how it all came together but there's this old guy who was in the streets of Hamilton in front of Kresge's in the right house and uh, Woolworths. Grafton's and Woolworths yeah, yeah. and all that and I remembered him just from memory and uh, I never knew who he was but uh, they later found out who he was and, uh, mm. and that's that was the premise of the song. Now if I can introduce you mentioned Bob there on the yeah. bass and the owner of Grand Avenue Studio, where there's been so many incredible albums recorded. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we got Ron Cole on the accordion back there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And uh, I just wanted to say that, oddly enough, Bob and I and Ron, we, when we were little kids, we went to the Y in Hamilton, yeah. drove down from Ancaster. Well, we took the bus, as I recall. <laughs> But, uh, and we'd see the same guy, you know, there's the, the, the fiddler and there's another guy who sold pencils that didn't have any legs. Yeah, I remember him. And uh, yeah, when you're a little kid, uh, that kind of hit you hard, so. And Percy at the Y, <laughs> remember him? Yeah. Yeah, the guy, yeah, the guys at the Y. Yeah. Anyway, let's do that song, The Steel Town Fiddler by Gary Lucas. Back in the 50s, when Lloyd D. was in town, Vic Cops was mayor, Stelco was strong. There was an old fiddler who played in the streets for nickels and dimes in what poverty grades. He had an old tin cup strapped to his waist, he wore Ray Charles glasses on his weathered old face. He played in the snow, in the cold, in the rain. I heard his sweet music, I never knew his name. The Steel Town Fiddler plays. The Steel Town Fiddler plays. He's there with his tin cup, he smiles when a coin drops, smiles with his gold tooth as you move on your way. His clothes have no meaning, size or shape, they seem to get in his way. Time is reflected in seasons of stains, and the light makes it shine anyway. The Steel Town Fiddler plays. The Steel Town Fiddler plays. He's there with his tin cup. He bows when a coin drops. Smiles with his gold tooth as you move on your way. I can hear him gently playing I can hear him rousing his bow I know that he could not see me But he could feel my presence, I'm told When the fiddle went silent, nobody knows Part of the legend that just seems to grow Sometimes when I'm all alone in the night I hear the Steel Town Fiddler play The Steel Town Fiddler play The Steel Town Fiddler play He's there with his tin cup he bows when a coin drop smiles with his gold tooth as you move on your way. Nice. 
nice, Gary. The Thank Steel Town much. Fiddler. Thank you very much. Well, Thanks. it's about Hamilton, so. Yeah, and that's Judy okay. Marcells, the only person in the audience clapping. I just got to mention it was Judy that brought us all together. Yes, she did. Absolutely. And thank you, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Because uh, if it wasn't for Judy, I would have never met you and and been here tonight, I imagine. Absolutely. So. Well, it's it's my honor and my pleasure. And, uh, yeah. you know, playing with you guys, it uh, what a change. I mean, I played with uh, a bunch of guys, uh, uh, a couple of them are social misfits on the road for years, and that was not fun. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to mention a few of those <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> well, social misfits. It's, uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a struggle, and, uh, and I've got to thank my wife and kids uh, for all their support yeah. because, uh, you know, I, I was out late at night a lot of times and uh, wasn't coming home, and, and uh, it was their understanding and uh, patience with me that, that helped me get through it all. Yeah, that's, that's good, good, good. Um, so back to Ronnie. Let's just start talking a little bit about him. So you met him when you were 17. Um, oh, there's a picture of, of you and the hawk there. Uh, yeah, that was at uh, Cobb's Coliseum uh, where uh, Ronnie was playing for the 9-11 at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did you, uh, I know you ended up living together. What happened there? I, I was, uh, I, tried, I tried to be a promoter, and I wasn't a good one, and uh, <laughs> you know, but I tried. And uh, I had hired Ronnie many times, and uh, different bands, and Truck and Greaseball Boogie Band, and you name it, during the, during the 70s and, eight, and no, during the 60s and 70s. And uh, I, I had just uh, had a large fiasco. I hired, I tried to hire Alice Cooper for the Sudbury Arena in 1970, and it all fell apart. And, got in my car and drove to Florida and tried to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And uh, he heard about it. I don't know how. And, he's, and we got in touch with each other. I'm not sure how it happened, but he said, ah, son, why don't you quit all that stuff and come on the road with me? We'll have some fun. <laughs> Luckiest phone call I ever had, I'll tell you. Yeah, come and, on the road with me and we'll have some fun. Oh, my God. And I, I knew what that was all about because I, I, I had watched from afar and seen the kind of lifestyle those guys had. And it was amazing. It, it really was. And uh, he he invited me into his life and his family. And, uh, uh, you know, his young kids grew up with me uh, there. It was eight years I spent there yeah. at Mississauga Road, the farm up in Peterborough, the place in London. He had the uh, old City Hall restaurant and tavern, his other place on High Park. And uh, it was just an amazing, amazing time. And uh, I, I couldn't, I, if I had, I always tell this pe to people, if I had three lives to live, I couldn't repay the guy for what Wanda and him did for me. Yeah. It was and, amazing. And Wanda, I got to say, his wife is just a real charmer. Yeah, she she's a sweetheart. She's so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, she, whenever we went there, she was just so hospitable, as was Ronnie. Yep. But, um, yeah, so at any rate. Um, he, he would have done this if he, if he possibly could have, and I know oh, that, I know. you know. Uh, I know he, he was. Uh, Pretty under the weather today, yeah, so yeah. it just didn't work out. Timing, uh, it's it was it's just bad timing, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. But he said he, you know, well maybe we can do it next week. I was like, well, no, we're it's a one shot yeah. deal. But yeah, anyway, um, I got some video here of because you st you lived at Hawkstone Manor. Oh, there, uh, okay, yeah. there we are. Okay, yeah. here's uh, here's Hawkstone. What an, uh, what an incredible property, you know. It was, uh, Whoa, okay, we got the music in the background too. Yeah, somebody shot this uh, drone footage of uh, Ronnie and Wanda's place. Yep. That's Stony Lake. Can you turn that down in the monitors a bit? That's Stony Lake in the background there. It's uh, maybe 30 miles north of Peterborough. Yep, exactly. Beautiful spot. And that's the point. There's, a, there's a, an island off the end there. There's a cabana and another cottage. And he just gave me free reign to do whatever I wanted and any time I wanted. And I believe in one of those cottages, uh, Gord Lightfoot stayed for a while. And he sure wrote, did. And wrote that song, Sundown. He sure did. Because it must be beautiful watching the sun go down over Stony Lake. Well, it was just an amazing place, you know. And I, I started up there in 71. And uh, I, I had no idea it was like this. It was, it was just the most amazing eight years of my life. And... Uh, it was uh, in my early life, I shouldn't say, my, uh, you know, not after I got married, but before I was married, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, skipping ahead to, um, you know, when the uh, 
the band got involved, uh, the Hawks got involved. Um, I'm just going to show you, and we're going to go back and show you some early Hawks, but I wanted to show you this uh, clip. It's out of The Last Waltz, which I personally think is the greatest rock and roll documentary ever made. Absolutely. Uh, arguably, like I'm sure there's other great ones, but uh, this had just such a cast of characters. Uh, you know, I can't... Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, uh, Ringo Starr, uh, Van Morrison, they, they just kept coming on stage. But what I wanted to point out is that the first guy on stage, and I, I get emotional thinking about it, but just watch how Robbie introduces the hawk because when this clip starts, you'll see the back of Martin Scorsese's head and Robbie's telling him about 16 years ago when they, they started out with, uh, with Ronnie and he got the, the phone call uh, from Ronnie. And the other neat thing is when you see Ronnie come on stage, he grabs Richard Manuel, the piano player, he grabs his drink and he drinks it and puts it back. And I think that's just so Ronnie, you know, I gotta have a drink before I get up. So he did anyway. it to me many times too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Get your drink. So here's, uh, here's uh, if we can roll the clip, Jordana, from The Last Waltz. Yeah. And I said, uh, <laughs> sure, I'd like a job. What does it mean? What do I uh, do? He said, well, son, you won't make much money, but you'll get more pussy than Frank Sinatra. All right, ready! <laughs> That's the last waltz. You got to watch that movie, folks, because it's it's so great. Um, yeah. So that was. Uh, let's go back to the earlier years um, when Ronnie first came to Hamilton, and uh, this is the point when we were going to have Ronnie tell the story. But Gary, you know it just as well, um, and it kind of starts with that guy, Conway Twitty. But uh, what did bring Ronnie to uh, Hamilton? Maybe you can explain that. Well. Uh Conway Twitty's real name was uh, Harold Jenkins, and he played with a group called the Rockhousers, and he had a uh, Hamiltonian playing with him, Dallas Harms. Dallas Harms. Yeah, and he was the, uh, he was the catalyst uh, for bringing Ronnie here, and they told Ronnie, who owned the Rockwood Club in Springdale, Arkansas at the time, where Conway had played and Jerry Lee played and everybody played there, about coming to Canada, and they said... And Conway said, Ronnie, it's going to be great for you up here because it's, the, it's, it's just like the promised land. You're going to be the big guy up here. And uh, so they came up in the fall of 1958 and played the Golden Rail. Right, yeah. And again, it was, uh, and um, Dallas Harms really saved them up there. That's for well, sure. we're going to tell you that story in a second, the Dallas Harms, how he saved them. But uh, have we got that on the screen now, Jordana? I'm just looking, I'm kind of confused, but if you go back a bit, uh, we had, uh, anyway, we're getting to um, picture 11 with the Colonel, Harold Cudlitz. We're gonna, yeah, there he is. Now, I gotta mention a couple of things about Harold. Uh, first of all, when Dan Lanois and I went on the road in 71, it was Harold Cudlitz and his brother Sid that uh, were our agents. They had a, an office at the top of the Sheraton uh, mm -hmm. Connaught. It was called back then. And uh, we walked in there, and I guess Ronnie and the Hawks had walked in there 15 years earlier or more. Um, at any rate, Harold was also called the Colonel. Everyone called him the Colonel. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, Ronnie, who gave him that name? Dallas. Could be. I'm not sure. Someone it, gave him that name, named him after the Colonel that was Elvis's manager. That's right, Tom Parker. Tom Parker. So. He was called uh, the Colonel. He went to Westdale Collegiate, Sid Cut, uh, Harold Cudlitz, and so did Sid probably. Uh, I'm just reading my notes here. In 1947, he booked Glenn Miller, uh, Benny Goodman, guys like that. 19, I got a note in 1951, he booked Duke Ellington into the Dundas Arena. Wow. Can you imagine the wow. Duke playing in Dundas? I, uh, so, and also, another neat thing about uh, Harold Cudlitz, he, he got the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Hamilton Music Awards in 2010. Um, Bob also got the Lifetime Achievement Award, um, but uh, Her uh, Harold got it in 2010, and it was presented to him by his nephew, who was, I was there at the time, his nephew was Eugene Levy, mm -hmm. famous comedian and actor in Hollywood. Uh, anyway, moving it into the, 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 um, 
the Ronnie years in 1958, that's when Ronnie came up here and Harold booked him into the Golden Rail. That's right. Now, where was the Golden Rail? On King Street. Uh, I think it was basically where Diamond Gems later was. I was never in the uh, Golden Rail. I was too young at the time, but that was the very first place he ever played in Canada. And when they started playing, he, Ron said to me, people were running for the exits. They didn't like what they were playing. Because it was rockabilly, right? That's and right. Was, and they weren't used to that. They're used to do Kellington and whatnot. Yep. Yeah, whatever. And, or straight country. Yeah, straight country. And then they, uh, of course, Levon was on drums, and they were playing some Hank Williams numbers. Well, Hank Williams never had a drummer. And uh, they, they just, it just did not go over. And Ron, in a panic, called Dallas. He says, Dallas, you've got to help us. You've got to bring all your friends down here, whatever you can do, but you've got to save us. And Dallas did. On a Monday night. On the Monday night. He and, packed it. Yep. And, uh, and after that, the people started getting used to it. And by Thursday, there was lineups, and uh, that, was the, that was the end of the story. That was uh, the, the beginning of, of the story, basically. Yeah. Dallas Harms, another great Hamiltonian. Sure was. Uh, country uh, singer and writer. And uh, he really knew how to rig the audience, as I call oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get yeah. your friends out there. Yeah. Dallas Harms. Yeah, okay. he came to my 60th birthday party, and uh, I really, really respected and, and uh, admired Dallas Harms a lot. Yeah. Ronnie loved the guy. Okay. So going back to the Hawks, the original Hawks, uh, which would have been 19... Uh, 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 58, I guess. They, it started out with just, uh, there's Dallas again, started out with just Levon coming up with Ronnie. They made the trip up, uh, the first trip together, mm -hmm. with a, the rest of the band from Arkansas. Yep. But as I guess as things developed, uh, they started picking up a different band. Yeah, a couple of them went back to Arkansas, and uh, and then, uh, of course, Levon always stayed, and um, they had Fred Carter Jr. on lead guitar. They had Roy Buchanan on bass. And this was before Robbie came into the band. And he was like a 15-year-old kid who just started as a roadie. And um, Fred Carter Jr. left for Nashville to become a session player. Roy Buchanan went on lead, and they tried Robbie on bass. And uh, they right. didn't leave on it. A few of the guys didn't really want that to happen, but Robbie practiced and practiced and practiced and as Ronnie said he'd go to the bathroom with his guitar he never left it slept with it yeah. and and became v real good extremely quick yeah well that's great and then of course they traveled around Ontario uh, like Port Dover uh, Hamilton they played here a lot in Hamilton yep. and along the top of Lake Erie there and started picking up some other musicians from Ontario, uh, Rick Danko from uh, Simcoe, right. that area. Uh, then there was uh, Richard Manuel from Stratford, the piano player that you saw in that clip, uh, getting his drink stolen. <laughs> and, uh, and then Garth Hudson uh, from London, Ontario, who was a, uh, an incredible musician with a doctor of music. He knew all the, all the rules about music. and. I think he played in the funeral parlor on the weekends or something. Could be. I read that. He played organ uh, in the funeral parlor. I and saw the first time he played, and oh my God, I, I just like couldn't believe the direction that the band has started going in. It was incredible. Oh, my yeah, God, yeah. yeah. It was incredible. Garth Hudson. And, you know, at first his parents weren't going to let him go on the road, and the story I got is Ronnie went with him to his parents right. and, and said to them, uh, you know, we got to have your son on the road because... Um, He's going to be the teacher. He's going to because they didn't want him to be in a rock and roll that's band. Right. But they said, okay, well, if he's teaching you guys, that's different. And you know, he's getting paid, so I guess that's okay. So yeah. they twisted their arm and, and got uh, Garth in the band, and that kind of changed everything because he knew so much about music that other rock and roll folk country guys just didn't know all that stuff. You know, all the baroque and classical rules that uh, that he brought to the band and, and made exactly. them so different. So, uh, yeah, that's how the, the Hawks uh, kind of got started. Um, have we got another picture there, Jordana? No, I think the next one might be uh, the video. And that would be, this is, okay, this is the video. <laughs> this is 1955, I think, or 58, somewhere in there. And uh, I forget the song he's doing, but I want you to watch this because everyone thinks 
Michael Jackson was the first guy to do the moonwalk. But just watch this clip now and see what you see. My blood cheese starts to run it like black a berry wine. Okay. That's the moonwalk. Oh, yeah, the moonwalk. And he had a lot of different acrobatic stuff on stage. He was oh also God. known as Mr. Dynamo. Absolutely. Right? And that's because he was a real, real dynamo. He was the most amazing uh, act I'd ever seen. I, when, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah, so, okay, so we're moving right along. Here's the Hawks. Now, there's a certain point, I think after about six years, they were with Ronnie, and then they split up. Um, and uh, I think, as you said earlier, Gary, they, they wandered around a bit and didn't do much for a year or two, and they got a call from this guy, Bob Dylan. Uh, there he is again. There's the band on stage. Uh, and Bob, Bob, uh, as you probably know the story, but Bob was just a folk singer for his first three albums, because I had all those albums. And then out came Highway 61 Revisited, and it had a rock and roll band on it. And, but the guy was such a great writer. For me, I didn't care what the you know whether it was folk or rock or what. He was a, a great writer. So, um, but a, most people did not like that at all. They sure didn't. And uh, these guys, the band, backing up Bob Dylan for two years, they were getting booed. Like Bob would come out and he'd do uh, the first set by himself. Then he'd bring the band out and they'd start throwing stuff at the stage and yelling and and that's why. The original member, Levon Helm, in the middle there, the drummer, uh, he quit after two years. He said, I didn't get into music to get booed every night, and I quit. And he went and worked on a, uh, an ocean liner or something. Uh, uh, oil, oil rig. An oil rig, yeah, yep. yeah. So <laughs> that's. Uh, yeah, he said, I'd never been booed before in my life. And he says, and every night it, was, it got you down so bad. Yeah. And they were still playing great music, but yeah. the folks yeah. hadn't caught up to him yet. Now here they are, this is in the basement mm -hmm. of Big Pink, yep. where uh, they recorded their first album, Music from Big Pink, which was in West Sogarty's uh, New York. My wife and I went there a few years ago and we, uh, we went to Big Pink. Um, I think if you move along, uh, there's a fo another photo. There's the band, there's the photo on top of, that was on the back of the record, I believe, which just showed you the house and it was pink. And then there's a the black and white picture of them standing there. And then I got a shot of it. The next one, I think, Jordana. Okay, that's me and my wife. We're not allowed, you're not allowed to go in there. There's signs all the way in on this little <laughs> dirt road in the forest saying, don't come in here. But I thought, hell, I'm going in there. <laughs> I don't care. And we only stayed for about two minutes because I thought someone might shoot us or whatever. So we left. But anyway, you can kill that picture. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get myself in there somehow. So in 1964, uh, oh boy, is that on the screen now? Because we are skipping ahead. But in 1964, I just want to say the Hawks uh, left Ronnie, and uh, they showed up at, uh, apparently in, in Harold Cudlett's office one morning because uh, Harold said, you know, he walked into his office and there were the Hawks, as he said, hawkless, <laughs> like Ronnie wasn't with them and uh, they were looking for uh, a gig. So he continued to book the band after that, mm -hmm. uh, Sid and Harold Cudlitz. Um, yeah, so, and apparently the Colonel, uh, Harold had some connection with uh, connecting, uh, he had some way of connecting uh, Dylan and the band. It also went through Albert Grossman, their manager, but, uh, but Harold was key, like he did so much for music in Hamilton. Harold and Sid Cudlitz. He sure did. Yeah. Now this next shot, the, um, I just wanted to insert this because I just found this shot a couple of days ago and I forgot that in 1968, John Lennon and Yoko Ono uh, stayed with Ronnie for what, a couple of weeks or a week? I think it was about 10 days. About it 10 days. May, may not have been that close. long, I'm not sure. And there's Wanda there uh, beside uh, between John and Ronnie, beautiful gal. Um, 
So anyway, uh, yeah, they, he, he stayed on the farm there, and uh, I think we got another shot. Uh, uh, this is John and Yoko riding in Ronnie's snowmobile. Like you can imagine coming, growing up in Liverpool, like he'd never seen snow, and, <laughs> and then to get on a machine. And, and then there's that story, uh, you could tell that story of when he got on the snowmobile to go hear the band practice down at the cottage. I wasn't there then, but uh, I heard, uh, I'm not sure of that one. Okay, maybe I got it then yeah. out of a book. But apparently, yeah, yeah. what happened is, I think it was Crowbar, or some of those guys were practicing down in the cottage. Ronnie was making them practice, and they, they weren't getting paid. Oh, it was to do Ronnie's final shows, I think, his final tour or whatever. Right. And they weren't getting paid or very much, so they got another job offer at some lounge somewhere that actually paid him good money. So they took the gig, but in order to take the gig, they had to learn all these corny, you know, songs, cover songs. <laughs> so meanwhile, they're down in the cottage practicing, and Ronnie says, hop on the snowmobile to John Lennon and go down, and you can hear my new band. They're really fantastic. He pulls up, he turns off the snowmobile, and they're practicing tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. John Lennon thought, I'm out of here. I'm not, I don't want to meet those guys. So yeah. kind they, of a, they, they blew the audition. Yeah, <laughs> they blew that audition. So then after the Hawks, we got to um, Crowbar, and they basically took over. Is that right? How did that happen? Uh, they, they were when Ronnie had them playing with him. They were called Ronnie Hawkins and many others, and then um, they they had they split up. Um, Ron and them had a parting. Um, Situation. They didn't. Uh, they didn't do exactly what he wanted them to do, and so uh, I think basically let them go. And uh, and then, oh, maybe about six months later, they came into I think the Grange that he was playing with a new band, and they said, "Listen, Ronnie, we've decided that we're going to start playing by ourselves, and we need a name for the new band." He <laughs> says, "Well, he said, why don't you call your, yourself a Crowbar? Could you screw up a Crowbar in five minutes?" <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a pretty good idea. So, so Crowbar. Ron, Ronnie Hawkins came up with that name, eh? He did. The leader of the band is uh, top center there, Kelly J. Uh, I'm sure some of you folks know him, another legend in, in the Hamilton area, uh, the leader of Crowbar. I think we got another picture of, uh, there's Crowbar. There's their kind of promo shot, I guess. Uh, there's Sonny, uh, and is that Paul, the drummer there? Uh, yep. Yeah, it I is. Know, I know a few of those guys. Um, and Richard Newell uh, with the glasses there on the bottom left, uh, also known as King Biscuit Boy, or as his friends called him, The Biscuit. Yep. Um, yeah, and quite an amazing harmonica player, Richard Newell. We got another shot of him, I think. Um, why not? Okay, but uh, yeah. And then... Um, after Crowbar, so many other, uh, oh, there's Kelly J, uh, uh, a little older, and there he is again in front of the Crowbar sign. There's another Richard Newell to his uh, brother, Sonny Del Rio, who played sax with the band. Uh, there's a picture of uh, the Biscuit with Gary, and uh, Gary with long hair. Yeah, that was at my 50th birthday. Oh, yeah, looking good, brother. Yeah. yeah. Hey. At the Polish Hall. There's three happy guys there. Yeah, okay, so then moving along, with they, he, uh, he started hiring all these other famous musicians, uh, other great bands. Uh, there's Jack DeKaiser, one of my favorite guys, a great, great player and, and performer. Uh, played with uh, Ronnie. We got uh, Rita Shirelli next, I think. There she uh, is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Michael Short, uh, Mike Short, who was Martin Short's brother, played uh, piano. We don't have a, I couldn't find a picture of him, but I tried. There's Bill Dillon on the right there. Uh, another amazing, amazing Hamilton guitarist and uh, influential musician around town. Um, I'm sure some of you folks know Bill and have seen him play. Uh, he, he played with Bob for a while, Bob Dillon. Oh, we're back to, here's a shot of, thank you, Jordana. That's, uh, the, we showed this all already, but that is John Lewis on the right who uh, also uh, played with Ronnie, but then he left to join your band, right? Yeah, actually he played with me first, and then um, I kept telling Ronnie about this young kid who played incredible, 
guitar, and Ron was playing at Breslau at the time, and I took John up there and, and lost my guitar player. Ronnie hired him on the spot. <laughs> he called him the 19-year-old boy wonder, mm. and he sure was. But that, we, we got a lot of mileage out of that, uh, that write-up. Um, I think guy's name was Dave Wesley, who wrote for The Spectator at the time. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, we had lineups because of, that, uh, because of that article and because of these great players that I had playing with me. Yeah, yeah. I played the garter a lot myself. It yeah. was a good little spot on Dundurn there. That's right. It's uh, now, um, oh, I forgot, uh, they sell food there, delicatessen or something. Yeah. But um, all right. Well, that's pretty well the story of uh, Ronnie's bands. And oh, I, I, let's not forget um, Janis Joplin's Full Tilt Boogie Band kind of grew out of Ronnie. They, right? they sure did. Um, John Till. Uh, Ricky Bell, Larry Tamanek, I'm not sure who the rest of them were, but uh, they were the nucleus of the uh, Full Tilt Boogie Band that played on Pearl for Janis Joplin. Wow. Yeah. So, well, back to you and Ronnie, I'd say. Uh, we got another picture, I think, of um, you and Ronnie as best friends. Uh, yeah, that was taken at the Kerrigan Arms a few years ago. Oh, and you just dropped in? Just dropped in. We were out in the car, and I said, you know, why don't you come on into this place I play on Thursdays and have a look. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, he caused a, he caused a sensation just by walking in the place. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he's and, a, and a friend of mine, sorry, Mike, a oh. friend of mine took that picture. His name uh, was Vern White, and him and Kathy are good friends of mine. And uh, I just want to say that uh, they're some of the nicest people I've ever met, and they just lost their daughter, and I feel so bad about that. And I can't imagine a tragedy like that, but... Uh, Anyway, Vern White takes all of the photographs that I've, that I've been doing with my own CDs, and he took that picture. I just want people to know that. Yeah, Vern White. All right. And there might be one more. Oh, there's... What's that now? Uh, we played the Festival of Friends about six years ago at the Ancaster Fairgrounds, and uh, there's Robin, on the, Robin Hawkins on the Robin, left, Mike Eastman on the right, and, of course, Ronnie and myself, and uh, we had the Partland Brothers uh, that were on that same show. That was a lot of fun for me. Yeah, Robin uh, is a great guitarist and uh, plays all around. He sure Robin is. Robin Hawkins. There's also Ronnie's son, Ronnie Jr., and his daughter, Leah. Right. That uh, we met when we were in Peterborough a yeah. few times there. Great little family. Yeah, so anyway, and I, I also wanted to say that Ronnie, like he is such a Canadian, although he Loves Canada. He just loves Canada. Like I watched so many videos and read stories of him, and he always called this the promised land, as did all the Negroes in the deep south that were trying to escape up here in the 1800s. But it, 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 it truly is. And I'm sure on the eve of the U.S. election, he's pretty happy to be living here in Canada. He sure is. <laughs> okay. Well, he always said, you know, son, he says, I can tell you what, Canada's the promised land. Came up here, made five million and spent six. <laughs> greatest, greatest country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love him. So yeah, he's always had, I guess, dual citizenship. Um, he, I think he lived in Arkansas until he was like 22, then he came up, and he's been here ever since. That's right. So he's far more Canadian than American, but I wish we had him on the show because he's got that wonderful uh, Arkansas he, accent. His stories are infamous. And They're just incredible. Yeah, and the way he tells them, <laughs> it's a joke every two seconds with him. If you're talking to him on the phone, I mean, he's, he's in pretty ill health these days, but if you're talking to him on the phone, you think you're talking to a 35-year-old. He's still got that, Spark. his mind is as sharp as a tack, and he's funny. He's the funniest person I've ever met. Yeah. <laughs> Naturally now, funny. Now, in 1988, he played Hamilton Place. I, I saw that. You can, you can see this on YouTube if you want to. I, I didn't take a clip, but there, the whole hour and a half set is on uh, YouTube. Yep. Um, and King Biscuit was with him. He'd, he'd had a couple of drinks, I'll tell you that. <laughs> You're kidding. Anyway. <laughs> and, and then in 2006, uh, he came up to Hamilton and received the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2006. Uh, I, I remember Wanda, I think Wanda was with him. Yep, and, uh, she was. Yeah. So there, there he is accepting the, the award uh, right here in, in the hammer. Um, also, another famous person would be uh, he played at Bill Clinton's inauguration. Again, I don't want to start talking U.S. politics, but boy, I love that guy. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he had Ronnie on the show, right? He was a big fan. You know, he just, he, he um, used to go to the 
dances that Ronnie played when he was just a young kid um, in Arkansas, and uh, was a fan. You know, yeah. that's basically how it started. Nice. Well, that's about it. Uh, there's, I got a few more pictures of great friendships. Like there he is with Chris Christopherson, one of his good buddies. And uh, I think we got a picture of you. Yeah, there's you and Chris. Yeah. I think you're trying to sell him a car. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was telling Chris at the time what Ronnie had done for me. And he said to me, Gary, he's done it for everybody. You know, yeah. and he has. He's, he has. He's helped more people, more people in the, in the music business and the entertainment business in Canada than any 10 people I know of. Yeah, and then I think there's a shot of, there's Gordon Lightfoot, another Canadian icon. Gave me my first guitar lesson. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and he signed your guitar, I think. Yeah, he did, yeah. There's a shot. Now, I took that shot in your office at, at uh, Burlington yeah. East End. So you can kind of see a reflection of me in there. I was, at the, I was at the Peterborough Memorial Center a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, as, uh, for as frail as Gordon looks, the nosebleeds were packed. He, the, the place was absolutely packed, and he has such incredible fans. They just love him, you know, and, that, and that's great to see. And I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan. I always have been a, a huge fan of Gordon Lightfoot. I think he's just an incredible writer, singer, guitar player, everything. He's just amazing. Hmm. Yeah, he's good. Well, why don't we do another song? Um, I'm thinking we should do that Bob Dylan song that, uh, that they wrote, uh, that the band did. Um, and that's fairly close to, to uh, Ronnie. Yeah, I do a uh, D, start an E. I'll play it for you okay. if you like. All right. I just got to get my guitar. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, this I think. Um, you and I have been doing this quite o quite often locally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think um, this was co-written by Dylan and the band, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do her. They say everything can be replaced And every distance is not near So I remember every face Of every man who put me here I see my life come shining From the west until the east Any day now Any day now I shall be released Say every man needs protection They say that every man must fall Yet I swear I see my reflection Somewhere so high above these walls I see my life come shining From the west until the east Any day now Any day now I shall be released Okay, Ron
Thank you. Well, I think we're coming to the end of the show. We've, I think we told about every story there is to be told. Oh, God so. Almighty. You know, there no, would have been no, so no. many more if, if so Ronnie many. was better. But uh, well, Maybe we'll get him next year or something. Well, you know what? Uh, we're going to go back up there again because uh, it just, uh, it's a pleasure seeing them. And, uh, you know, I've, like I said, I've never had a better friend. And uh, I wish him well. And he's, uh, like I said before, he would have... If he could possibly have been here, he would, or on the phone, he would have been. Yeah. That's no, for I sure. Know. I know. He's such a great guy. There he is there. Well, just before we go and do our last song, I just want to say thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, Judy Marcells, of course. Judy Marcells Real Estate. Uh, Able Pest Control. And uh, Neo Dental, my own dentist in uh, Ancaster. I think they're great. Marie Phillips, who's been our number one sponsor from the very first show. Uh, her company, Next Steps Planning and IPC Securities, financial planning. And then our crew, we've got Nathan Fleet on the camera. We've got Norm Thornton of Long and McQuaid's uh, working the sound. Uh, we've got Mark Scola and his wife, Jordana, tonight working the video. And um, let's see, Patrick Maie of Clear Cable and Dave Gruggan is here doing still photography. And then we've got our staff, Dan Fournier and Neil Miller. So thanks to everyone who, who's helped to put the show together. Um, we're going to take a break from the shows being on Monday nights. Uh, we're going to, this is going to be our last show up until Christmas, just before Christmas, December 14th. We're going to do um, a Christmas special. We're featuring, uh, I'm calling it a, a cranky Celtic Christmas because <laughs> it uh, features a Celtic band scantily plaid <laughs> I, I like it think for a minute scantily plaid i like it with ruth sutherland uh and doug fever uh they're going to join us and play some celtic christmas songs followed by wendell ferguson who's kind of the cranky side of it because he's got a a bunch of funny christmas songs <laughs> you got to check this show out because he he's such a great songwriter and guitar player and he's going to be doing that show for us just so he can do some of his cranky christmas songs so, um, yeah, that's about it for this show. We're going to finish off with a Ronnie Hawkins song. And I want to say, just before we go away, thank you, Mike, very much. Uh, it was a pleasure playing with you guys. Mike, Ron, Bob Deutsch, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure just to be on stage with you guys, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, Gary. And, uh, and thank you to uh, Ronnie and Wanda for uh, being so hospitable and Hopefully we'll we'll figure something out down the road, but uh, we're gonna inter we're hoping Ronnie would introduce this song because he, you know how he always introduced this song. He you always, could do it. He always said, "Folks, this is the one that took us from the hills and the stills and put us on the pills." And it goes <laughs> like this: <laughs> I'm gonna give you 40 days to get back home. I'm gonna call up a gypsy woman on the telephone. I'm gonna send me on a worldwide hoot. That'll be the very thing they'll search you. Gonna see that you will be back home. Forty days. Oh, forty days. Forty days. Forty days. Oh, forty days. Gonna see that you will be back home. Private early, early this morning. And gonna take it to the sheriff's office to sign a warning. They're gonna throw a cross charge against me. That'll be the very thing that sent you. Gonna see that you'll be back home in 40 days. Oh, 40 days.
Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, guys. December 14th. See you then. All right. Good show, Gary. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.